this has been, at least for me, I'm going to be completely frank and honest with the audience. A lot of this has been really confusing for me. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. Hey, welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show. We are your hosts with the most, Austin and Fabio. And today we're going to be talking about interactive brokers, ticker symbol IV. Way to hammer in the energy, Austin. Further ado. Yeah, we should probably. No, no, that's amazing. <laughs> that's the it is? Band. Yeah. Okay, true that. All right. Because uh, anyway, Austin, so... Austin doesn't know what he's getting himself into right here. Okay, yeah. So, he's so am caution. I? Am I? Am I? Uh, not an energetic person, or am I an energetic person? That's that's the question here now. Well, you are you are an energetic person, but you're you're approaching with caution right now. <laughs> Welcome back to the capital. Mindset, should I? Though. Should I? Should I be afraid? about what's what's to come next <laughs> well maybe i don't know if we're gonna see like the the uh yo guys welcome back to the capital mindset show <laughs> is that better is that what we're looking for all right anyways today we're going to be talking about ibkr and without further ado let's jump right into this what are we looking at here today okay so <laughs> our channel i think it's fair to say is now known at least a little bit with those who watch us for talking about vies yes right? i would say that's probably our bread and butter at this point. yeah and um we got a request from one of our subscribers one of our lovely subscribers to do ibkr which is basically a brokerage platform in which investors it's one of my, it's actually my favorite one by the way i don't know if, i think i've mentioned this to you mm-hmm. several times i love ibkr yeah okay yeah. so uh, interactive brokers is my uh, platform of choice. And um, that being said, the business itself as an investment, we're going to explore whether or not that it's worth our time. Um, it was actually very interesting to research this business. It took a little bit longer than other businesses because I had to adjust for some things. And you'll see why. It's, it's, um, I'll give Austin the hint. Because he actually has no idea what we're stepping into. Uh, remember that rocket video? Oh boy! Is this, well, it's is not this... that. No, it's not like that. It's okay. not like that. All right. So, um, Austin, tell me what you know so far. While I'm pulling up the, the the pictures, tell me what you know so far about interactive brokers. Um, I know that it allows you, or correct me if I'm wrong, it allows you to buy shares even though like you might be located in the U S you can yeah. legitimately buy shares on like the Australian stock exchange or the United Kingdom Correct. stock exchange. But other Correct. than that, I don't really know too much about this business. Well, I'll introduce this to you. Okay. Oh boy. So oh. it's actually not that bad. Okay. So I was hinting at it in the beginning, this is a VIE, right? Uh, yeah. But we rail a lot against VIEs, but what kind of VIEs have we railed against? Typically, we rail against VIEs that have pretty significant differences in economic interest or no uh, economic interest. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is a VIE specifically? This is what no channel really gets good at explaining mm-hmm. um, because I've seen other channels explain a VIE very poorly. They just basically define the acronym. And then that's as far as they go. Some of them go very briefly on specifically some of the chain in a VIE, but VIE is simply variable interest entity. But what does it mean profoundly speaking? It it can be anything. It's a variable interest entity. It can vary, right? So there are people who are dedicated their careers to designing entities and these structures. And it's basically like planning, right? So uh, interactive brokers is another VIE, but not all VIEs are bad, right? So when we rail against some VIEs, we need to add that context. We, we have added that context. We've said that in those videos that not all VIEs are the same. VIEs is an umbrella term. So this is one of them. And this is you're looking at one of the non-bad ones, okay? So this is not a bad VIE. I'm spoiling it, but I'll go through it and explain it. And this is actually provided to us right here to kind of help us go through it. So you are the public stockholder. And with that, uh, you own the class A common stock, right? Yeah. So this is what you're basically buying. 
and you're buying shares of this entity right here, right? Yep. And this entity owns 21.8% of the actual business at the end of the day. So this guy, this is a guy basically, right? Mr. Thomas, whatever. And uh, he, he owns the majority stake and he owns uh, okay. 100% so of class B. Yeah. I now have a question here too. How is this in this instance, a good VIE? Because what I'm seeing here is that the public stockholder only gets to own 21.8% of the actual business itself. Does that mean that in this instance, the profits are then going to be split amongst that too? Or does what's, what does this entail here? What uh, am I looking so at? Great question. That comes down to this split at the very end. So that they own 100% of this business. Yeah. And this is the, this is the difference. So here they have the voting power. So IBG Holdings LLC controls Interactive Brokers Group through voting, but they don't have any economic interest. They have zero economic interest of this, of this entity over here, right? They just have uh, voting rights to this interest. They have economic interest to this entity. By the way, this is the only one worth having economic interest in. You only want economic interest in that entity because it's the one that actually makes all the money. Yeah. So there you have the split. You have the split of 78% ownership by this entity and then 21.8% ownership by that entity. Now, if you remember going back to the rocket mortgage, the splits were happening, happening a little bit differently along the chain. So this added some extra complications as to where something can, or it increases the variability of situations in which the class A common stockholders could get screwed. In this case, it's actually fairly clean. It's fairly clean. So the Interactive Brokers Group, they own 21.8% of IBG LLC. They own 21.8%. You, class A, own 100% economic interest in Interactive Brokers Group, Inc., which then owns 21.8% of IBG LLC. Effectively, it keeps the same percentage down the line. If you do that math, you do 21.8% times 100%, or, or you can multiply by one, that equals 21.8% of the final uh, product. So of this entity down here, and I've already circled it so many times, <laughs> but um, of this entity down here, let me get my pen again, you own 21.8% effectively. Am I making sense? Yeah. So now my, my kind of question is to um, just sort of drawing from what I'm looking at here. Can I extrapolate correctly here that a good VIE, typically you would not be seeing a, um, a uh, division in economic interest. So if you are retaining 100% economic interest in such instance, of this, then that could be constituted as a good VIE in this instance. So basically the point that I'm trying to make is that sort of added nuance, but more so just sort of putting a box onto this, a good VIE versus a bad VIE is basically predicated upon the split of economic interest here. Split of economic interest and how it's split up is very important, how it's split up. Not okay. simply, and it's, I'm not talking about percentages, I'm talking about structurally speaking. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, you'll see like entanglements here. There's not really entanglements too much uh, because the, the two entities, I need to use, not use my fingers because you guys can't see what I'm pointing to the two entities right here. You can see my mouse, right? Yes. So this entity over here and this entity over here, they are the ones that own the entity making all the money. And then their split is 78.2 going to here. It's 21.8 going to here. So these are separate shares, right? Yeah. Okay. So this guy owns 100% of the shares of this, right? And this is, this is actually split up. So it's actually these two uh, bullet points, right? So you can just read the bullet points, but I don't want to really go into that because we don't really care about them. We just care about this yeah, entity yeah. as a whole. Okay. So this entity as a whole owns 78.2%. And these individuals up here in, in uh, de facto own 78.2% of the income of the actual economic interest. And remember, separately from the other VIEs and similar, similar to Rock, Rocket Mortgage, you actually have economic interest. 
Okay. So like the income is actually attributable to the end uh, holder because it's, it's not actually through a contract. It's through, um, it's through uh, uh, ownership, right? So membership interest going here, and then you are owners of this. So you're not direct owners, but you're owners of something that owns another thing, right? So it's still, still a variable interest entity. Um, however, it's not the contractual version or variant, and it's not going through multiple jurisdictions. Okay, and, okay. Mm -hmm. So now I think I'm actually understanding this. Basically, what we're looking at here is a VIE in which you still get to own, keyword here, own a piece of the pie. It's not one by which, you know, you were signing yeah. a contract for when that capital yeah. can be returned to you at a later date, but you actually mm -hmm. get to legitimately own a piece yeah. of the pie here. What, what makes yeah. it a VIE, so versus like some in, in, uh, companies have um, dual, dual class, right? So class A, class B. This is kind of the case because there is class B, right? But class B is only voting. Class B has only voting rights. Class A has voting and economic rights. Now, the reason why it's a variable interest entity is there's this other entity over here, IBG Holdings LLC, and they have just voting rights in what you own, but they have economic interest as a separate arrangement going to IBG LLC. That's what turns it into a variable interest entity. Because some companies, let's take Google, for example. So Google has A, B, and C, class A, class B, class C. And the class, I think it's a class C and class A are publicly traded and class B is the founder's share or for the founder class. Um, what separates them is not economic interest. There is actually equal economic interest. What separates all of them is voting interest. And so this is actually the common place here. You see class A and class B. What separates them is actually class B just removes the economic interest, right? It just has voting interest. And then, for example, in um, in Google's case, Class C has no voting interest. Class A has one sh one vote, one share. And uh, don't quote me on this, but Class B might be ten votes or one hundred votes per share. It's the founders. It's how, how they can maintain control of the business. Yeah, uh, yeah. With controlling less economic interest. So the point here is the, what makes it a variable interest entity is the separation of these entities right here. So you have this one that you own, and then this is a separate entity over here, and it owns the class B that only gives it controlling rights or controlling interest in what you're buying. Okay. You have 100% mm -hmm. economic interest of this entity that then has 21.8 economic interest of this entity the final entity, the one that actually matters. That's what makes it a VIE. It is not the same as the other VIEs we've railed against, again, because that not all VIEs are created equal. It's a very nuanced thing. You got to actually do it the is. legwork and figure it out because these structures can yeah. be very in complication. This is actually a very simple one. Um, Rocket was a little bit more complicated. And also- had, had a couple more entities that we were dealing with there too. Yeah. It did. And, you know, and it and had it, a little it, bit it more It kind of really avenues. came down to a, yeah. And it also came down to Dan Gilbert too. And a lot of the way that he was splitting economic interests coming from to his one entity, I think it was like Rock Holdings. Don't, don't quote me on that, where he was, was the primary shareholder of, and then his actual himself too. So he was going that direction. And then there was a bunch of other things. There was like one exclusive yeah. entity there that like retained like non-common voting stock. And yeah, basically it was, it was pretty complicated. Um, we did a video on that a while ago as, and why we were not exactly excited about rocket specifically because of this ownership structure, but all right. So kind of moving on from the ownership structure of IBKR itself, could you explain a little bit of what this business is, what it does, and then also to what some of um, the financial statements here look like as well, sort of the financial health of this company right now. And then also, too, where you could potentially see this company going within the yeah. next five to 10 years, let's say. So we're going to be doing the model at the end of this video, but I think yeah. it's important because, um, one, this, this individual asked a while ago, so we want to give them the due respect that we go through the entire business, give them like a bigger breakdown than than a regular stock. And I think it also That's deserves a long it time ago. extra yeah. complications with this stock uh, or company. Mm -hmm. So. Um, this, let me just, uh, well, I'll say this while I'm showing everyone this. So I highlighted some, uh, of the net interest margin and for this entity, it's 
very important that we pay attention to this because of the nature of the business. So you can kind of classify this as a bank. It's kind of a bank. It's not really a bank, but it kind of is a bank. There is loans going on. Um, and these loans, right, are reflected in the net interest margin. Now we're going to explain, for example, these segregated cash and securities. Um, and these, uh, there's going to be other ones that are, for example, I think, let me see if they're here. Um, yeah, I think these ones up here are the regulatory ones, but we'll, we'll see them in a separate line item. Um, but it's to kind of introduce to everyone how complicated an entity, entity like this can be and why financials or banks can be some of the most aggravating to really kind of dive into. And some of the ones that are I would say most people should be avoiding unless they really want to do the legwork and um, really understand the business because it is more complicated than the average business. This is not your Kellogg's. This is, you know, its own its own thing. This is another okay, so monster. To to ask here, um, just actually, if you can pull up that image again, just for a quick second. I refuse. There. I kind of want to go through this a little bit. What is net interest margin? What is it typically? And then how does it apply here to IBKR? Well, also mm -hmm. next to that as well, would you kind of touch you kind of touch on this a little bit beforehand, but would you also touch on this again, the segregated cash and, and securities and how that yeah. also kind of plays a role in I'll these play, financials as I'll well? I'll talk about that later because that, that okay. I went separate for that one. Okay. So yeah. net interest margin, it's basically just the actual average interest rate that they're getting on all of their assets okay uh, because they have a lot of loans on the books right so they have a lot of bonds and we'll actually talk about that that's why i'm i'm saving your second question for later um and they're affected by the interest rates as they fluctuate and what is one more risk with interest rates if your business makes money off of interest rates austin what is another risk that you have to be careful with let's think um I don't know. What is it? Inflation. Oh yeah. Inflation. <laughs> yeah. Inflation. So, so inflation, if inflation averages, for example, um, above a certain amount, you will have negative returns, right? In real terms. So there's nominal and then there's real terms. You want to be careful with that. Uh, so kind of digesting what you've seen so far, what do you think? Um, I, I think it's, I think it's definitely in, interesting. I think to sort of add some more uh, colored nuance onto this as well. I think that I'm about to see financial statements that I'm not typically used to seeing. No, so I'm going not. to have to think way outside the box when yep. it comes to IBKR in so, terms of this. Um, inflation and investment in US government security. So this is actually the, the, the beginning of your answer to the second question that you asked before. So yeah. here they're actually describing some of the risks and inflation is a big one, but they're saying that it's not, they don't think it's going to be big going forward. So we believe for the three most recent years, inflation has not been a material impact on our results of operations and will not likely have a material impact in the foreseeable future. So basically they're taking their projections and then they're saying that they don't think it will be going forward. They're just covering themselves basically there in that statement because they have to say that, um, uh, and they're justifying it because of past performance, right? So that way they can't, you know, get sued if inflation's really bad and, you know, oh, it's not, uh, it's out of our control because it is, it's out of their control. So the other part is investment in U.S. government securities. So some people don't know this, that, but part of the financial system actually requires, or not, the laws that govern the financial system require financial institutions operating within the United States to hold what is known as risk-free assets. I've explained this to you, Austin, in person. And when yeah. I when I opened your mind to this, you you kind of were like, yes. what? Yeah, you yes. saw how messed up yeah. kind of the system has sort of come in. Well, it, again, like the Chinese VIEs, um, it was not something I got the first time you told me. <laughs> so no. it took, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty complicated concept that took me a couple of times before I started to decently understand it. So you know. I want everyone to sit kind of at home and think think of it like this. Um, so imagine if I'm making up all the rules, right? Let's just pretend I'm a dictator for a little bit. And you better hope that doesn't happen. Then. <laughs> but um, <laughs> imagine if I'm dictator for a moment, right? And I can say, I can make up all the rules I want. And then I'm going to require you 
to hold what I'm going to call risk-free assets. I'm going to require you to hold it, which means you have to go get them, right? And um, I'm going to decide what they are because who's making the rules? You are, obviously. So if yeah. I get to decide what a risk-free asset is, right? And this is going to become standard financial theory from here on out because I decide so. Uh, what do you think I'm going to make it? You're obviously going to make it something that you have economic interest in. Oh, yeah. Something. Yeah. I'm going to make it my debt. All right. So I yeah. want to go out and borrow money. And I'm going to call that the risk-free asset. And you're going to have to buy it because I, I'm going to force you to say 20% of your net worth, Austin, has to be in my or not in my, I won't say it explicitly like that. I'll say risk-free assets, which then I shall define risk-free assets as my own debt. Seems fair. No, cool. I'm glad you, <laughs> I'm glad we can agree. I, I'm glad we can agree on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm expecting <laughs> you to find my debt. All right. All right. Cool. See, the point is you have, the point is you have no choice. All right. So yeah. we, we have to acknowledge that there's going to be some segregation. So the cash on the books isn't actually fully their cash. All right. And then we'll see this further. So um, digesting that, how do you feel about that? And here's, um, I'm going to answer your question now here, by the way. Yeah. Like, if, if, if I'm being honest, it definitely, my own personal opinions, it doesn't seem fair, but it also just is the way that it is. So it is the way of, that it is now. You just, you just have to adapt to it. I know. Yeah. It, it, in the United States, in, in, in yeah. the East, it's remember it's, it's things are different in other places, but oh, um, now that's interesting. This is what I was going to tell show you. This Cash is segregated for regulatory purposes. Mm -hmm. Securities segregated for regulatory purposes. Yes, Those are probably playing into exactly the same thing you just yes, talked sir. about, the risk-free assets. Yes, sir. Specifically because what we're dealing with here is a bank, basically. We're dealing Essentially, with Essentially, it's not really yeah. a bank, but it, it, it's, yeah. it's a quasi-bank. You can think yeah. of it like a bank. And these are, these are some of the assets that we can kind of see, uh, liabilities. But I, I'm highlighting for you, and I actually had the um, thought that you were going to ask that question, but this is the first time Austin's seeing any of this. But basically, the actual cash on this business's balance sheet is $4.2 billion. The other cash is actually restricted because it's regula for regulatory reasons. Okay. So now I have, <clears throat> if I can annotate here, now I have even more of a question. And so now I'm kind of wondering if the cash flows from operations, are they just specifically taking into account this? We'll get there. Cash and cash equivalents? Or we'll are they also, all right, I would, I would like it if it would remove my name, but you know, sometimes life doesn't work out I can't out that see way. your name. Okay. Yeah. Don't so, worry. all right. Those are, those are sort of the questions that I yeah. have now specifically okay. pertaining to this. So for, for our audience, oh, there's your name. when Fabio and I kind of go through these sorts of things, this is really just the way that I like to prime my mind as I think and just kind of um, approach these concepts because not only does it help me learn, hopefully you guys are also learning along with me with this sort of thing. So, so, but anyways, please, please continue. Yeah. So you can actually see, I mean, it's, it's very different things than you'd see in a regular balance sheet. So this is why uh, we're taking the time to explain this business. So this is how you'd kind of see other financial institutions um, and hopefully derive different kinds of um, not different, but like it helps you in making your analysis. All right. So real quick, let me pull up because you were asking other questions and mm -hmm. I wanted to show you the cash flows, the statement of cash flows, which is the next piece. Yeah. I think you'll find this one interesting. So um, they have a ton of cash, right? Cash movement. Because this is what the statement of cash flows is. A ton of cash movement in regards to make... movement of securities. Yeah. Here's that, the problem. That, yeah, yeah. You remember when I say to the audience that I have my issues with gap net income, but what do I yes. say? What I, what do I always follow that up with? There's but a, you understand why it's, yeah. No, no, that it depends, right? It really depends. I've said it multiple times that are, there are instances in which um, gap IFRS is better for certain industries because some industries, it depends on how they recognize and how the activity is connected with the income, okay? So it just depends. Um, so in this case, the cash flows are gonna be misleading. 
That's why I highlighted it. That eight billion in cash flows, not true. This is a company. This is a company, Austin, that is valued at about thirty-ish billion dollars, thirty-something billion dollars. That would imply a cash flow, price to cash flow, of almost, almost like three. It's getting there, right? Oh wow! It, well, twenty-four would be three. So if it was twenty-four billion, it'd be three. But uh, just a smudge more, like less than it's five. like three, three point two. Yeah. No, it's not three something like two. that. It's not three point two. No, it's more than that. If we did, yeah. for example, I think it's like thirty. I think it's like 32, 30 something. We'll see in the model, but that would be okay. a four. So it's less than five. So it implied price to free cash flow of five. Uh, and the CapEx is basically nothing. I'd even highlight it here because it's like 50, 50 uh, uh, million dollars. It's nothing. Yeah. It's basically, and, and they disclosed it, that it's basically technology investments, but um, it's nothing crazy. And okay, so what, so hold on, hold on. Yeah, I yeah. want to make sure that I'm understanding what you're saying correctly. Mm -hmm. This 8 billion number here, Mm -hmm. Again, this 8 billion number, mm -hmm. this is not the actual correct cash flows from operations here. Not that you're no. implying fraud of any kind. No, no, that's, that's true. It's the true cash flow from operations. However, you're going to have to do custom calculations for this kind of entity. This is why there's such a headache. Oh, okay. This all is right. why there's such a headache. This is what makes them difficult to understand. Because look at all these, I highlighted change in operation activities, assets, sorry, and liabilities. The problem is you will have to go through all of those uh, line items and individually kind of analyze them and think if they're actually from the operations per se. And so it's like a Venn diagram and it has to be the middle part and reflective of um, actual cash expenses for the business. And a lot of them are not. A lot of them are exchanges. A lot of them are borrowing <clears throat> securities. A lot of them are per putting money away for <clears throat> regulatory reasons, you know, mm -hmm. so or getting money from regu for regulatory reasons. And, and like, for example, I'll, I'll highlight one right here. Uh, so payable to customers. And then the uh, where's the other one? It's receivable from customers. Where's receivable? Yeah, receivable there from is. customers. Yeah. So those two, they don't really cancel out, but you can't really that payable to, to uh, customers is cash coming in. And then the receivable to customers is cash going out. Yes, but it's about the settlement of the, of the trades, right? And they explain this in the 10K. They're nice enough to explain that, but it's the, it's the settlement. So like when you sell a stock, you, your cash there hasn't been given to you, hasn't settled yet. It takes about three business days for it to settle. So that's included in that transition period right there. Right. So the point with I'm, what I'm getting with that is you want to create or really critic, analyze critically the different line items and you're going to come up with your own. And basically, if you want to kind of simplify it, you won't get the perfect number, but you can simplify it is you don't have to count the change in operating assets and liabilities. What you find when you just use these line items up here is you get a number that's very close to actually the net income which comes to, we come full circle to my point that uh, net income for an entity like this is actually fairly reflective of the operations. It's fairly reflective. It really is. Yeah. So, given, given, given the actual nature of the business itself, that would yes. probably make sense. Yes. Yeah. It, which it is the added layer of nuance that we're kind of providing yes, here. Precisely. Yeah. So normally okay. I like to use cash flows more than net income. And most people <clears> say, <throat> I think, I think there's a growing number in the, in the YouTube community that is saying that, uh, which is good. However, I'd be very careful because you're be careful of creating a, a process that you think will apply equally and successfully to everything. Yeah, there it does, but in a, in a philosophical sense. So like in a broad speaking, there's a way of thinking about things. Yes. However, specific techniques may not carry forward. This is an example of that. So cash flows, if you use the net cash flows provided by operating activities and you subtracted out the CapEx, your model is going to be wrong. Let me say that again. Your model is going to be wrong. It's going to be trash. I'll throw it away. If I'm the senior analyst and you're the junior analyst, you came to me with that model, I throw it away. I'd slap you around. Be like, what are you doing? You're out. All right. Um, um, okay. 
any now, questions? Now, here's, here's just sort of my question here too. You've highlighted down here distributions from IBG LLC to non-controlling interests, which is this number right there. This here is the portion of the net income that's being reported on this sheet that is going to um, that entity that that one individual holds in the VIE structure. Basically, case in point, this is the other part of the VIE that's receiving that other 78%, right? <clears throat> um, I have to do the the final calculation. I was going to do that raw, but it's actually around there. Okay. Um, and uh, that, that no, no, actually, that, I think that might be the dividend. Um, we can go back. We can go back. But wait, that's two hundred eighty three million. Is, does that add up? It actually might add up. I think you might be right, Austin. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll double check in the end. But uh, okay. So basically, the point the point that I'm really trying to make here. Anytime you ever have a VIE and you see something like non-controlling interests, this typically represents a portion yep. of that VIE. It typically represents a business process that's sort of happening with that VIE, given distributions to owners in, within that ownership sect of the VIE or um, net income attributable to non-controlling interests is in direct proportion to that VIE. So if you were to check the, the um, financial statements of Rocket, you would see a lot of non-controlling interests, and that is just pretty much validating um, a lot of the transactions that are sort of happening inside of the VIE. But I just wanted to point that out because to me and Fabio, with both of our okay. accounting backgrounds, I it seems, yes, go. No, I, I actually just confirmed quickly on my phone calculator. Yeah, yeah. So that's actually coming out of the cash, the free cash flow, um, not even the net income. So if you take the proportion that is attributable from the net income, it's actually a smaller number than that. So the number I calculated <laughs> from the... Um, uh, uh, free cash flow attributed to us is actually that number. Okay. So you, it, it confirms that. Okay. I was going to cool. save that for, for the model. Cause I was going to show everyone. Well, I'll still show everyone yeah. what happens if you make a mistake. And, <laughs> yeah, and no, I was, I was, I was actually about, about to say, this is actually a lot of fun. It, this is fun yes, looking at this fun. because it's not like, you know, it's not the most orthodox financial statement I've ever seen. It's, it's kind of all over the place and it's really, it's fun. It's like putting together a big puzzle, you know? So essentially the, um, the, again, you, you'd get very close to the number by just doing what I told you. It's a very quick way. Um, there are, yeah, you, you'd get within a margin of error, a very small margin of error. But, uh, I think the, for example, if you do that calculation, you come within, let me see the separation between these two numbers. Um, Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. You know, it's, it comes really close. It's only a difference of 2 million. Wow. With 1 billion. So you can do the percentage in, of, of error. So the, the error percentage is actually just $2 million. Okay. And just, just, to, just to recap for what you're doing for the audience who might may not oh, be following. So along. yeah. Um, yeah. What are you, what are you, what are you doing? Basically <laughs> I'm, take, I'm taking the net income. And I'm subtracting mm -hmm. out all of these line items and I'm ignoring yep. the change in operating assets and liabilities. So okay. that number gets very close to the actual number, like very close. We're, we're about 2 million away. Um, and then if you want to actually take a look at the actual income attributable to you, you can, well, I'll, you can, you can, another way of doing it is you can see the distributions and you can divide that by uh, 0.218 and then you can actually arrive at that number as well. Okay. That's what's that's what you care about as an owner. Yeah, and, and he's and and he's using the point two one eight because that is what's outlined in the VIE structure for the audience. Correct. So Correct. okay. All right. So I'm going to finish off with one last uh thing before we get into the um nice. The model's my favorite part. Yeah, the model. Let's go. <laughs> the model is gonna be interesting for this one. And and this is a longer video for the point of ex explaining the VIE. Uh, yeah. again, and also, this, also too, because this was like a request from so long ago that yes. we're getting to. So we figured we would do an absolute, you know, S tier video for you here. So, so here is something that's important for this business. That's why I'm pointing it out. This is a true nah, for all fair businesses. Value hierarchy. Exactly. So oh, yeah. why is it important for this business, Austin? Think about it. Um, because it deals a lot with securities. Yes. Correct. Precisely yeah. true. So which one are they going to be using the most of? And then they're very careful to tell you this. Um, they're going to be using level one the most. Um, 
Level three? A lot of level three. A lot of level, that's, oh wait. Okay, so they're using a lot of securities, which typically rely on level one, which for those of you who might not know, the like the fair value hierarchy, level one is um, quoted prices in the stock market. Level two would be like the value of your house. And then level three are unobservable inputs that management basically estimates. So this is really interesting because if they're dealing a lot with securities, which typically rely on level one fair value inputs, why, what, what, why is it level three? Well, what's, what's going on with level kinda, three here? I kind of lied. They do have a lot of level one, but the level okay, one, so it's, a lot so of it's time, both. So it's like nuance here. Yeah. Yeah. But they have a lot of level three because they're dealing actually with a, a ton of indirect instruments, which is how they were explaining it. And uh, the level one primarily consists of the government securities that they don't really want to own, but they have to own. So they love, they value it at level one. Uh, the level three is some of these indirect assets that they hold on their balance sheets that are not directly quotable each and every day, and that mm -hmm. they're deriving, you know, an estimation of value, but the value is not definitive. The level one is just basically the securities because the securities that they hold, you got to understand that uh, you don't want to, you want to separate the securities borrowed versus the, the securities they actually own. And then really what's in there is mostly the securities that they're forced to own and the cash. Okay. So, okay. Um, but that being said, it's, I hope we kind of got across that. It is a complicated um, business. It's a very complicated but, business. It's, it's not, fine. it's not a business that you could honestly, with all due respect, plug into basically anything and then be like, okay, this is better than this. This is better than this. Boom, 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 boom. Check. Good. Like it's something that you have to like, actually do some pretty serious research and look into and dive into the numbers, understand there's nuance with this business, Correct. understand that the box that you might approach this with, you got to open that and think outside that box. So let me make sure. Yeah. I returned the uh, numbers to normal. So this is, for example, if you just, um, let me show everyone. Let me post Yeah. This. Yeah. You got to share, you got to no, share no, the no. screen. I'm not ready. <laughs> the model's no. not ready yet. <laughs> at me. All right. Uh. Let's see how long it takes to port in IDKR. Nice. Where's my little pen? I want to annotate eventually. All right. So um, looks like you passed middle school math. Okay. Recovery, Kelly, whatever. All right. So, uh, so far we have a price target of 84, balance rated as a hold. Okay. So look at what the model is doing. Everyone probably noticed as soon as we walked in. And this, 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 I do want to cut in. This is the reason why we do not place or hedge all of our bets on this model because the model is only in so much as good as the formulas that it relies off of. But that's why you need the human capital. You need the knowledge capital to go not, into not, this thing, not to extrapolate the story. The inputs. inputs. Yeah. The yeah. Inputs, not the formula. Yeah. The input. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You know? so, because, because right now, what, what's the problem? We just kind of um, touched it. There's actually two problems. Yeah. What are the problems? Tell me. What are they? So the, the problem is right now, it's uh, taking in the cash flow from operations, but not taking into account the dual class. Okay. All right. So we have to actually account for 21.8. And then I'm going to take everyone through why it's complicated. So let's go back and let's go here. And let's actually... Uh, plug this puppy over here and I'm lazy. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. We're going to plug it right there. So then let's, let's do that. Right there. Oh, I forgot to do that. That's shift B. There we go. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at the problem now. Yep. Problem still not, still not corrected. What did I do wrong? I am such a goofball. What did you do wrong? I am such a goofball, Austin. What did I do wrong? What did you do wrong? <laughs> well, it's a complicated business. Why is it a complicated business? Because it's a financial institution. What yeah. did we just discuss in the ca uh, cash flow from operations? We were, we were discussing that they deal a lot in securities. And then the fact that in this instance, you're, you place more emphasis on net income here. So, All right. Well, remember... I'll share again with everyone. We'll, we'll come back to the model. 
just to mm -hmm. remind everyone. What's this over here? This is 2020. Yeah. The model's taking 2021. Yep. So we're, we had 10 billion. Uh, so it increased by 2 billion. But then we, we, got, uh, we got from that the 21.8% and ended up being 2 billion. But what's the problem with using this number or the newer equivalent of that number? It includes all this. It includes yeah. all this crap. Not yeah. crap. It's, it's actually cash movement or it's movement of cash. So it's actually appropriate for it to be there. But it's not actually accurately representing what's going on. So we have to go back and do another calculation. And uh, that calculation, right, ends up being about what? what um, you, you can just say, I don't know. I just threw you on the spot because I'm, my mind yeah, I, back yeah, I, I, your mind is, uh, it's, working way faster than i can keep up with right now if i'm being honest <laughs> it, it comes out to about around with the margin of error about 320 or 320 million okay so let's go back to the model and let's actually go back and correct this so we see go back to data dump and we have to manually input and we're going to actually turn this to zero because we don't want to double count capex so 320 million dollars and now, now we're in. Now we're in the go. We're good to go. Ah, uh, now we're in business. Mm -hmm. And now it has a standard uh, price to free cash flow. I want you to notice something. What do you notice about the PE? Oh, the PE is they're more higher. or less in line. This yeah. is a smell test that I did the right thing. Interesting. I would not have extrapolated that from this. Well, because Austin, I was telling you earlier, yeah, and the audience that for this kind of institution, the actual uh, earnings, the gap earnings, is actually very reflective of the cash flows, right? Because oh. you have to customize the cash flows for yourself. The cash flows from operation at the bottom of that part of the balance sheet, or not the balance sheet, the statement of cash flows. Um, is not accurately reflecting the actual true cash flows from operations. However, the net income is doing a decent job at it for this kind of entity. So the smell test is if I'm getting actually pretty close to it. Um, it's it, Again, I, it's a rough calculation. So it's kind of within the margin of error. I would have to see, for example, the uh, new 10K and then do the distribution there. But I'm, I'm actually fairly close. I'm fairly, fairly close. Remember that the cash flows will not ever be the same as the net income, but I'm telling you that the net income is better. It's, it's going to be better. It's going to be quicker. Let me, let me be very specific because I'm not, I wasn't being as specific as before. It's going to be quicker. Okay. Because, for example, if you went back to the uh, uh, page here, and um, let me actually pull, pull her up again. I know we're going back and forth, guys, but bear with us. I'm trying to make a point here. So if you take 21.8% of this number right up here, you will not get this. You'll get close to it. So for those of you who uh, want to know what that number is, times 0.218, it's about $257 million. So you can kind of see there that that's not actually accurately reflecting what, what's really going on but it's mm -hmm. fairly close. It is fairly close. That number is close enough, right? Uh, to what the operations are. And if you can see here, the going back to the model, I'd more, I'd be more willing to trust the cash flows, but I'm telling you that the net income is a smell test. Does that make sense? Look at that. You see how yes. they're fairly close. Yes. See that? So, so the net income was, is lower when, when I just proved proven to you guys is that net income is typically like lower than the cash flows at least for the past couple of years. In this case, it's also true from what we got. It's still true. The price, the cash flows are lower, or sorry, are higher than the earnings. And that's why we have a lower multiple. Am I explaining myself properly? Yes. Okay, so basically- case, The multiple case is lower here. because the cash flows are higher than the net income. And then okay. now the, the model is kind of having the proper numbers because before it, you had a PE of 21.97, but a cash flow of like, I don't know, three, four, somewhere around there. I think it was four, less than five. It was less than five, which, which looked out of whack. And then you're just looking at it. And if you do a discounted cash flow, and for example, 
if the model you're using, whoever's model you're using is not doing the nuance work, you're going to get the wrong answer. And that's yeah. going to be a problem. So this is hopefully teaching you guys to be careful with that nuance. All right. So taking a look at the average growth. And also, let me just say, sometimes like Howard Mark says, if something looks too good to be true, it might be actually, right? So in this case, we can kind of actually visualize what the, what the market is predicting for the stock. And let's actually not kid ourselves here, but interactive brokers, if we see interactive... I should have shown everyone this first. It's actually risen quite a decent amount, right? Right over here from here. Yeah. We have a 26% increase in, in stock price, um, but not necessarily the same amount in business performance. So it's the model should be telling me that you should be careful of what you're assuming going forward. So I have to assume a decent amount of cash flow growth in order for me to consider this a buy. No, looking back at the average growth, it's been about 14%. So if I don't, I don't want to assume, di well, actually, let's, let's not assume dilution for now, but let's prepare a negative 5% dilution. Okay, but let's prepare it. All right, so then let's get some more growth up here. So let's say this one will be a 20%. And then let's do a 18%. Okay, we're, no, we're 20. Not yeah, 20, 20 is basically your minimum threshold there of what you would need. In so this instance. exactly 20% yeah. and above. So for example, right now, the model is telling me for my requirement of 15% rate of return, I shouldn't be actually buying at these prices. However, if you can get it, for example, at 54, which I think it was just there. It was, it yeah. was almost there. It was just there, like just there. We just missed it. Um, it was actually saying you, you could buy. However, we weren't assuming any dilution. So if we assume some dilution, then wow. boom, across the board. So you got to actually get this at a fairly discounted price, which let's take a look at the uh, five year. And yeah, you see pandemic levels, it hit in the 37. Yeah. So if going back to the model, do we see a 30s? Yeah, we see right there, even assuming dilution, right there, that would have been the moment to buy. That's, that's, that's the time. You got a good, always 2020. And this got a good deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, no, if you had the, the model, it, it would tell you right there. Yeah. Because again, you, you have to be assuming these assumptions, right? Yeah. And you would still be assuming these past assumptions. And then you, it's all about the forward assumptions that you, you plug in. And then if you want to be pessimistic on the buybacks, it would have been telling you. So we're not actually the, the cash flows. If we want to say, if you want to actually test out what it was a year ago, we can do that. We just have to plug in 283. What makes it easy about the VIE in this case is no CapEx. And yeah, there you go. Right there. This is as if you were looking at it a year ago. Hmm. Um, I'll go ahead and actually, well, actually, I'm, I'm already assuming a lower dilution than what actually happened. So it's fine. I'm compounding it just slightly less. So uh, essentially, if you were looking at this a year ago, more or less, you'd say, okay, 18%, uh, what, what did it get to? Yeah, 37. What was that? 36. Yeah. There you go. You'd have a buy across all of these and above. However, you'd have to assume that that would be the case. Uh, unless you lower your threshold assumption. So let's say you do this uh, 12, 12%. This is a year ago's numbers, Austin. Okay. Wow. Any comments, oh concerns? No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just taking, I'm just taking this all in. This is a really, really complicated company, so I'm kind of struggling to keep up. If any of you in the audience are feeling the same way, well, I do too am feeling the same that way. I can help, help alleviate. Perhaps. Um, I've, I've asked everything that I really can ask at the moment. I'm just legitimately just trying to take everything in at the moment. All right, fair you enough. Know? So, if anyone else has questions about IBKR, you can kind of leave them. Uh, down below. But yeah, this last bit of the model is basically showing what would happen if you were looking at it a year ago. So I'm just backtracking um, into last year's numbers. And um, from here, you know, it, it's fairly interesting. I mean, if you wanted only a 12% rate of return for, for compounded over 10 years, I mean, you would be buying. I think uh, this is some, some uh, YouTube channel's standard. I think that everything money uses 12.5%. It's not a dig. It's, it's uh, just a statement. 
I'm not digging this. That, that'd be weird if people think that's a dig. But yeah, if you, you, you were looking at this a year ago, you'd be like, oh, interesting. I can assume 15%. Maybe you think 15% is too high. So um, what can you assume? Can you assume 14? Yeah, you can even assume 14, which is actually within the average. And by the way, I'm assuming dilutions. Okay, I'm a, I am implying dilutions of 5%, not buybacks or anything like that, just straight up dilutions. Now, um, one last commentary uh, about this company. And it's, it's like a word of caution. So inherent in the VIE, this is, this is typical of all VIEs. And I talked about this in Rocket. This is a VIE that's lasted for a little bit longer, Austin. Do you know where I'm going with this by chance? No? Where? No, no, no. Like actually like Shares. no, like where? Yeah. Shares. So we talked about the risks about rocket companies diluting you over time and how they have the in every incentive to do so. Um, and there's so many ways in which they can do it. Inherent in VIEs is the inclination to treat the publicly traded stockholders, oftentimes like piggy banks, even when it's not necessary to do so because of the separation that the management or the largest owner has from the, uh, from the uh, shareholders, which is typically why VIEs will always trade at discounts. They'll always look cheap. Um, and they, they'll, never, they'll never be or trading at a, they'll never trade at a premium, right? Uh, because of the structure. The structure is a deterrent from, for a lot of investors. For me, for example, I prefer not to. Um, I, I don't want to say I would never invest in a VIE. Actually, that's officially not true, but that will be another, that will be the separate announcement on another video. Uh, for example, if we analyze Dutch Bros, which I haven't even looked at, and we already got the request for it, which is another American VIE. Uh, IBKR is British, by the way. It's not American. But if we, if we look at uh, Dutch Bros and I end up liking it, I may invest. You know, I, I don't want to rule it out. I don't think I will mm -hmm. because of the valuation, uh, but I, I don't want, want to put a blanket statement, say I'll never invest in VIEs. Uh, but, yeah. but we can, I hope I made it a little easy. So I killed two birds with one stone and I was able to show everyone what a VIE can look like, but this is a VIE that's safer. And even then, even then, you're still kind of being used like a piggy bank. So that that the reason why this VIE is safer is because that still gets down to the same thing we always talk about with the value of the investment actually being oh, ownership. And in this instance, you can I actually back. own something, correct? Yes, but I also take it back. I have to do before I make that make that statement as of record, I actually would need to do further research on whether or not the large shareholder is just us selling their shares because that mm -hmm. would also constitute dilution but then i'd have to see how they are if they are gifting themselves new shares and then selling old shares to maintain control or may not maintain control but maintain the same economic interest and if they're doing that then they're doing what i fear that rocket will do and it would be actually a perfect example to showcase to everyone what rocket companies is incentivized to do not necessarily what they will do and it would show as a case study that IBKR has done this with the majority shareholder doing that. Uh, in simplest terms, what I'm trying to say is the large owner, right? If I, uh, let, me, let me pull it up so I, so I have a visual aid and not just like talking and hopefully everyone can just imagine what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but we know that they've been diluting you, right? So, um, can you give me the pen, please? <laughs> Stop <laughs> wanting to give me the pen. All right, All right so uh, if you can imagine this, right? Uh, this guy, he owns whatever percent, right? And we know that the Class A common stock has been increasing in number. There's a couple ways that can happen. They can issue new Class A common stock, or this guy can be selling his Class B. If he sells his Class B, they become Class A. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. I kind that. of, I, yeah, class I actually B under. becomes class A. So yeah. this is like we're at rocket companies and if exactly, that's yeah. what's been happening, then that's concerning. All right. If they were just issuing new class A, cause, cause it's, it's kind of weird how you see how things can start to get 
extra layers of complicated. I hope mm-hmm. that that is not the case. But if that is the case, I wouldn't be surprised because that's what I expect from a VIE. Um, and again, this is a safer VIE, which is like, when I say that the ones that we've been railing against are like, wow. Okay, let me just say it. They're, they're the McDonald's of the stock market. VIEs are? Yeah, they're the McDonald's yeah. of the stock market. You are, you're buying the McDonald's. Let me, let me okay, I'm, just, I'm not going to sugarcoat it anymore. <laughs> As a structure, huh. they're the McDonald's no. of the huh. stock market. Um, and the McDonald's of the stock market. Yeah, they nice. really are. They're, they're, they really are. And, and you should, you should really be careful with these kinds of things. The, the financial world is really famous for creating these weird instruments and screwing the, the people who don't really know what they're doing, uh, which is yeah. usually like, for example, class A, but like this one, this company has been able to successfully, despite the dilution, et cetera, is such a good company that it's able to return value to shareholders and you still own the, uh, end entity you just have this structure which allows there to be a a hampering on those returns because this individual is able to do things that if they weren't able to do would not hurt you right they are hurting you and 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 i have no i have to do more research to see if that's the case for example if if class b is being converted to class a through sales and then if this person is still getting more class B common stock, that would be something maybe you guys would want to do research in if you're interested in it. I'm already kind of Xing the stock. So I'm not really, you know, I wouldn't normally just do more research into see, finding that out, but that's something I would actually encourage everyone to try to find for themselves if they're interested in investing in this company, because that changes the dynamic as in it kind of tells you where this individual, where, where, what he's thinking. He's thinking about mm-hmm. enriching himself at the end of the day. He's, and he's doing so at your expense, right? Because he's getting his dividend and then he may be selling his class B common stock. Oh, and I want to be very specific. It's not just selling the class B common stock. It's also is if he is also getting new class B common stock. You know, I want to be very explicit. If he's slowly giving away his class B common stock and he's not creating new shares sure there is a dilution happening for class a but at least there's a limit at the end right because all slowly over time what he's doing he's just giving up control he's actually not losing economic interest right but i assume there actually may be sometimes a tie between these and in which case he once he sells this this entity will give greater economic interest to this entity unless he has some separate arrangement in which he is selling these to class A, and then this entity is actually gifting, or not this entity, this entity is gifting him uh, new class B as like stock options or some something like that. That's what you'd have to be careful with, all right? So that's okay. actually where I'd leave off. That's that's my last final warning. Okay, cool. Well, um, do you have any closing thoughts here before I wrap up the show here today? This has been, nope. at least for me, I'm going to be completely frank and honest with the audience. A lot of this has been really confusing for me. This is really the first time I've kind of dived into looking at a, for lack of a better term, a pseudo bank, a pseudo bank type stock. So I'm definitely interested in doing further research into um, <clears throat> learning more about this business. Really? A lot of what you were saying today, it definitely went over my head and I'll be, and I'll be completely honest, but that's also the process of just me learning too. So if you guys have any questions, please be sure to leave them in the comment section Long below video. and yeah. we will we yeah. will respond to all of them. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, we are your hosts with the most, Austin and Fabio. This is the Capital Mindset Show. Please be sure to share our video. It really helps out the channel. Please be sure to visit our website at capitalmindset.org. Like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll see you guys later. Take care. Mm-hmm.